Welcome. My name is Rob Skiba, and today we'll be talking about the Archon invasion and the return of the Nephilim. This will be part one of two. Uh, so let's get started. The Nephilim is uh, something that has become a, a bit of a subject that has uh, become really intriguing to me. And as uh, Steve Quayle is another researcher, he's got a book here called The Genesis Six, G Genesis Six Giants. As you can tell, it's a pretty extensive volume here. This documents finds of giants throughout history, uh, recorded history as well as biblical history. And so, yes, there were, in fact, giants in the world. Those are called the Nephilim in the scriptures. Steve Quayle is fond of saying that the understanding of the Nephilim is the Rosetta Stone for understanding all of scripture. And that seems like a pretty bold statement, but I've actually found it to be true. Uh, that as I started to understand what's really going on in Genesis 6, so much of the Bible just all of a sudden came alive and started making a lot more sense. Like, for instance, why is God telling the Israelites to kill all the women, kill the children, kill the animals, wipe out all whole villages all the time? And then you get to the New Testament, and Jesus says to Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen my father. I don't know about you, but that never computed in my head. Because <laughs> I see Jesus in the Gospels loving everybody, judging nobody, healing the sick, cleansing the lepers, you know, giving sight to the blind, casting out demons. I see this amazing, loving guy, and yet the father looked like he was into genocide. I can never understand that. I can never put those pieces together until I began to get an understanding of the Nephilim. So this presentation is going to focus on who they are, what they did, and what they may do when they return, and possibly the near future. Uh, this material is coming from my new book. I just finished publishing my first book, Babylon Rising and the First Shall Be Last, which is our poster here for that. Uh, this book was just published a couple months ago. Uh, this is book one of four. Book two is in the works. I hope to have it done, hopefully, uh, in, and have it in print by September. So the, what, a lot of the stuff they'll be talking about today is coming from the content uh, the, of that book. My method of research. I do consider myself to be a researcher, and by that I mean I research that which has been searched by others before me. <laughs> and so uh, when I approach this subject, I really want to do so as sort of an investigative reporter or a detective looking for clues. I'm going to research approaching the subject with an open mind starting from scratch as opposed to basing my conclusions on those already made by others. Uh, I grew up with my life verse, 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show yourself to prove unto God, a workman that needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So anytime I heard somebody speaking about anything anywhere, I never just took it at face value. I would go back and like a good Brian, I would search these things out to see whether they're true. I've always been like that. And so uh, it, sometimes it's difficult because we all approach different subjects with the lenses, so to speak, that we, that we were taught. You know, we were taught certain things, certain ways of looking at things. And so we look at, like the Bible and the scriptures, different things. We will look at um, through those lenses. So I've really tried to take a step back and look at it objectively as if I've never heard anything from anybody before. Because I have studied a lot and I've read what their conclusions are but I wanted God to speak to me and just help me to come to my own conclusions. So sometimes I came to the same conclusions the other researchers did, sometimes I came to different conclusions. And uh, if you've read any of the other people's material, you'll find out some of the things that I differ uh, as we move forward, uh, some of the things that I take uh, in a different direction. I'm gonna look at solid empirical data. I wanna see if I can verify what I'm, what I'm looking at. Is there any evidence? I'm gonna look for evidence that supports the data. I'm going to try to limit speculation to only what is supported by the data and evidence found. And now, when we're talking about some of these subjects, all of us speculate to one degree or another uh, based on uh, not enough information given. So, but I believe you can look at the available evidence, both in the scriptures and some of the extra biblical texts I'll talk about in a minute, to help put pieces together uh, to come to your conclusion. But uh, I'm going to try to limit my speculations to evidence. I'm not going to speculate out of thin air, okay, uh, for some of the things that we're going to talk about. Try not to speculate from a position of biblical silence or extra biblical silence. Uh, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, establish truth. And you see a bunch of scriptures right there. Uh, the Bible makes it pretty, pretty plain that if you want to establish truth, you need at least two to three witnesses. Two to three witnesses to establish truth. So I'm going to be looking for that in the scriptures. I'm, I'm, if, you should never base a doctrine on only one scripture. That's what I was taught. Uh, there should be confirming scriptures uh, for you to base your conclusions on. 
and I'm going to develop a thesis based on the above criteria. So that was kind of the rules I set for myself as I started writing this book and putting this presentation together. A minute ago, I talked about extra biblical texts. I like to call these the synchronized, biblically endorsed extra biblical texts. Uh, in filmmaking, I'm a filmmaker by trade, they don't shoot uh, audio and video on the same equipment. They, they shoot video, they have a, a, a director of photography sh shoots the image on the camera, and then there's an audio technician that's sh recording the audio on a separate device. And so the editor, when he gets both of these uh, things t given to him, he will do what's called sync, syncing the picture. And so many of you have seen in the special features, they got the guy out there going, scene one, right? Take two. The reason they use this little thingy is because uh, film is 24 frames per second, video is 30 frames per second. So what an editor does is he watches frame by frame, man, you've got 24 frames to look at or, or 30 if you're working with video, to see frame by frame when the clapper connects. This is called a slate actually, when the slate connects and he marks that video. And then he looks on the audio wave. You've all seen audio waves when somebody's talking. He looks for the spike for when he heard the clap. And he, he syncs the spike with the frame that shows that the slate has connected. That's called the picture, getting the picture in sync. I believe that you could do the same thing with these extra biblical texts and the scriptures. These uh, texts that you, have, you see up there, the book of Enoch, the book of Joshua, and the book of Jubilees, actually tell a very, very detailed story about what's going on in Genesis 6. And they all sync up with each other perfectly. They, they all tell the same story in the same chronological order of events. And when you put all four together, these three extra biblical texts as well as the, the canonized scripture, Genesis chapter 6, it tells you a very detailed story, each book filling in a little bit more of the blanks. And so uh, as we go forward in this teaching, I'm going to make references to uh, these three books as well as to the scriptures themselves. I call them synchronized because they do sync up with each other. I call them biblically endorsed because the Bible itself, I'm not going to argue whether or not these are canon. I'm not going to go there. The Bible itself endorses these by quoting them. Jude basically cut and paste entire sentences and put it in his kind of short little freaky book. <laughs> and Jude's a pretty wild little book. And, and a fair amount of it's coming right out of the book of Enoch. And how many of you believe that the Bible, the, the canonized scripture, is divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit? And we read that in the Bible, right? That, that, that uh, men wrote, but the Holy Spirit inspired them to do so. So under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, God told the author of Jude, yeah, go ahead and quote quote the book of Enoch. Uh, and I would submit that Moses was probably aware of it as well when he's writing the Torah because you get six chapters into the first book of the Bible and he throws a word out like Nephilim and doesn't give any further explanation for it. Because everybody just, oh, okay, yeah, we know what the Nephilim are. Yeah, sure. Well, how'd they know that? There had to have been some other source for them to be aware of. Uh, and in the case of like the book of Joshua, it's actually mentioned by name twice, two witnesses, right? In the canonized scripture, in the book of Joshua and 2 Samuel, it is mentioned by name. In, in Joshua, that one's really interesting because that's a story where Joshua commands the sun to stand still, right? That's a pretty far out story when you think about it. Because that means the earth stopped rotating. <laughs> the sun st you know, stood still in the sky. That means the earth stopped rotating. Well, the way it's written in Joshua, it says, is it not written in the book of Joshua that this happened? Well, that's like using that other book for credibility. Because everybody, well, we all know Joshua's true. I mean, that's the way it's, it comes across. So, uh, again, if it's good enough for the, the uh, scriptures to endorse it, I say, let's go ahead and look at it. Same with Jubilees. There's other references to the Bible that come from the book of Jubilees. So that's why I call them biblically endorsed. Uh, I'm not going to base any doctrine, especially anything that has to do with salvation. I'm not going to base any of doctrines on extra biblical texts. I'm going to stick to the canonized text. But I'm going to look at these to color the text a little bit for historical value. If it um, goes along with scripture, great, wonderful. We get added detail. If it conflicts with scripture, throw it out. Simple as that. That's just the way I look at it. Uh, so we'll be looking at some of those books. You notice the title, Archon Invasion, The Return of the Nephilim. So, so let's start off with who or what is an archon? <laughs> uh, we've got a scripture here, Ephesians chapter 2, wherein time passed, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, Ephesians 2.2. 2. That word there, prince, is archon in Greek. It's a uh, masculine noun. It simply means chief, ruler, uh, prince, leader, commander with authority. 
in the book of Enoch, we find that there are 20 named archons. There are 20 individuals named as the chief princes or leaders over the 200 watcher class angels that landed on Mount Hermon in the days of Jared. So we could think of these as, as leaders uh, and, and sort of like the generals in charge, so to speak. So that's what an archon is. Now, how many of you think we're in the last days or coming pretty close to it? Well, I do. And this scripture really stands out to me when I think about that. Where Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. And if we all agree that we may be getting pretty close to the coming of the Son of Man, then we've really got to take a look at the days of Noah. And as I started to do that, uh, one of the things that jumped out at me was the fact that Noah lived for 950 years. And most of the time we say Noah, and the first thing we think of is Noah's Ark. And that's about the extent of it. You know, we don't really think too much past that. But the reality of it is he lived 600 years before the flood and 350 years after the flood. And a whole lot of weird and wild and crazy things happened on both sides of the flood. And Jesus said, take note of that because some of that stuff's going to happen again. Uh, some, if not all. Uh, I'm going to talk about what I call the Genesis 6 experiment. The Genesis 6 experiment is essentially summed up in Genesis Chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, I've got 1 and 2 listed here, where it talks about the fact that the sons of God came unto the daughters of men, and there they bare children to them. Now, we see in the synchronized extra-biblical text support for that. We see that in Genesis 6, it calls them the sons of God. In 1 Enoch, same thing. It's interesting that it actually syncs up to the exact same chapter and same two verses, Genesis 6, 1 and 2, as well as 1 Enoch 6, 1 and 2. Genesis calls them the sons of God. Enoch calls them the angels or the children of heaven. And Jubilees chapter 5 verse 1 calls them the angels of God. So here we see clearly that we're talking about angels, not the sons of Seth as is taught in many seminaries today. I think that whole theory is completely absurd and unsupported, so I'm not going to spend any more time talking about it. But we see in the synchronized extra biblical text as well as the scriptures itself that sons of God is a reference to angels. In fact, if we go outside of that and just go into the historical documents, uh, I've never heard a pastor, theologian, teacher, evangelist who hasn't at some point in his career referenced the works of Josephus uh, to give support for what is in the scriptures. And his, Josephus was a first century historian, uh, well-respected historian, and he comes right out and tells you the same thing, that it's angels that we're talking about. Uh, he writes about that in Antiquity of the Jews. The New Testament refers to them as the angels that sinned. In 2 Peter 2, 4, and 5, it talks about the angels that sinned, that they are bound in chains of darkness. And I, I like the way Peter actually writes this. It, he, he says that they are, uh, were cast down to hell in many of your translations. But in Greek, the word is Tartarus. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, I think that's the only time that word is used in Scripture. Uh, I could be wrong, but I think that's the only time. What's interesting about Tartarus, if you, many of you went to, how many of you went to public schools? Uh, even if you didn't go to public schools, you may have read the Odyssey, the Iliad, some of the Greek mythology. All right, and that's kind of mandatory these days in, uh, in secular school. Um, that's where the Olympians put the uh, Titans. They, they bound up the Titans in the prison of Tartarus. It's the lowest level of Hades. We see the same thing in Jude, verse 6. The angels which kept not their first estate were kept in everlasting chains of darkness. Okay, And in Jubilees, chapter 5, Verse 6, we have a, a, a parallel scripture there, or writing, if you prefer, talking about the angels being bound in the depths of the earth, and look, they are bound in the middle of the earth. Now, God's judgment against these angels that sinned is given in quite a bit of detail in the book of 1 Enoch, and it talks about a couple things here I want to focus on. It says that their offspring, okay, these would be the first generation Nephilim, uh, it says in the bold there, For length of days they shall not have, and no request they make of thee shall be granted unto their fathers, which would be the watchers, on their behalf. For they hope to live in eternal life, and that each one of them, that being the Nephilim offspring, will live for 500 years. So God's setting an age limit for the first generation Nephilim. They're only going to live for 500 years. And the Lord said unto Michael, Go bind some Jaja. He's one of the archons. He's the leader of actually the leaders. He's the, he's the head archon, if, if you prefer. Uh, Samjaza. Go bind Samjaza and his associates who have united themselves with women so as to have defiled themselves with them in all their uncleanness. And when their sons, that would be the first generation Nephilim offspring, have slain one another and have seen the destruction of their beloved ones, 
Bind them, being the watchers, fast for 70 generations. Keep that in mind. 70 generations these guys are bound. In the valleys of the earth till the day of their judgment and of their consummation till the judgment that is forever and ever is consummated. Okay, so we find in, in the book of First Enoch that the first generation Nephilim were only going to live 500 years and they were to kill each other off in that time. They're, God was going to basically cause a civil war where these guys are going to fight and kill each other off and the watchers, their parents, are going to be made to watch their beloved ones die. How many of you would like to see your kids massacred? Anybody? No, of course not. Nobody. Well, neither did they. That was part of their judgment was to watch their beloved children be massacred before they were put in chains of darkness in Tartarus. There's a DVD that I produced last year called the Mount Hermon Roswell Connection. And in that DVD, I detail five reasons why I do not believe that there was a second incursion of fallen angels. This is one of those areas where I differ from my colleagues that study this. Most people that I know who study the Nephilim believe that there was what's called a second or multiple incursions. Incursions being the act of angels mating with women. They think that it happened in Genesis 6 and it continued to happen after the flood again and again and again based on their view of Genesis 6-4, which we'll talk about some more uh, shortly. I disagree with that. Uh, remember when I talk about the, the uh, details that I try to hold myself to? One of the things is confirming scriptures. I can find zero confirming scriptures for their view of Genesis 6-4. If angels made it with humans again, the scriptures should have told us so. Not only is it not in the Bible anywhere that angels ever made it with humans again, it's also not in the synchronized extra-biblical text. Biblically endorsed extra-biblical text. <laughs> so here are the five reasons. The judgment against the watchers was extremely severe, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in this presentation as well. That's one of the reasons why I don't believe angels made it with women again. Two, again, like I just said, there are no confirming scriptures for their view of Genesis 6-4 in the repeat incursion theory. Three, size began to drop dramatically. The book of Enoch says in chapter 7 that the uh, first generation Nephilim got as tall as um, 3,000 L's. 3,000 L's, according to Dr. A. Nyland's uh, translation of the book of Enoch, is equal to 300 cubits. 300 cubits is 450 feet. Interesting thing about uh, that number, 300 cubits, is that's the same dimension as the length of the ark. So I thought, wow, isn't it interesting? Uh, here it is in Enoch chapter 7. And the women became pregnant, and they bare large giants whose height was 3,000 L's, or 300 cubits. We have a hard time imagining a 450-foot tall giant. It's inconceivable. Greeks didn't have any problem with it, though. They called them the Titans. I'm just throwing it out there. That's what the text says. Take it for whatever you want. In the post-flood world, however, the Bible does give us some detail about how tall the giants were. And at max, the most you could get is maybe 150 feet. I think is more likely 35 feet, and we'll talk about that in a minute, based on Amos 2.9 and a few other things, like in Numbers 13 and some of the things that are described there. So we went from, theoretically, 450 feet to 35 to 150 feet. Size dropped dramatically for Nephilim in the post-flood world. The world should have become completely corrupted five times over. Genesis 6.12 says that all flesh had become corrupted as a result of what happened in the pro previous verses of Genesis chapter 6. Okay, so, and best to my calculations, the uh, first generation Nephilim, the days of Jared, the incursion that took place on Mount Hermon in the days of Jared, happened roughly 3550 B.C., and I base that on, and I'll show you a timeline in a minute, on the works of Dr. Ken Johnson, Bishop Usher. There's a lot of other people that have put together timelines based on the genealogies given in Scripture. Based on the genealogies given in Scripture, uh, if that's true, if the first incursion was 3550 B.C., then they were on the earth, the Nephilim were on the earth in one form or another for 1,200 years up to the time of the flood. And in that time period, they were able to completely corrupt all of God's creation. Well, they've had five times as many time periods to do so. If they could completely corrupt all of God's creation in 1,000 to 1,500 or 1,200 years, they've had 5,000 years to do the same thing. How come we're still here? No, I don't believe there was a second incursion. And why science instead of sex? And that's what I detail in this particular DVD, is all accounts of abduction and things like that. So you, just got, you see an alien gray there. I think that's just repackaged Genesis 6 activity. That's what I think all that is. Uh, but you don't see that these entities are having sex, you see that they are extracting seed, they are extracting eggs, they are doing scientific experimentation to create embryos and things like that. 
So why all that? Why, why go through all the laboratory experiments if all you had to do was have sex? It doesn't make any sense. So I don't believe, these are the five reasons I don't believe there was uh, a second incursion or multiple incursions. God's severe judgment. I told you I'd talk a little bit more about that, so let's get right into it. Do angels tremble at the judgments of God? Some of my colleagues would say no. And they would base that on the fact that look at how much evil is happening in the world and look what the demons are doing and, and the fallen angels are doing in the world today. God doesn't seem to, you know, he's, he doesn't seem to do much about it. You know, he, he allows them to do that. That's, that's their argument. Um, that may be true. They, they know that the lake of fire is waiting for them at the end of everything. Uh, but this judgment, God appears to be putting, uh, drawing a line in the sand. He's allowed them for whatever reason in God's sovereignty, he's allowed them to do what they do in the world today. But he draws a line in the sand when it comes to mating with his creation. He says, if you're going to mate with my creation, here's the judgment. And it's extremely severe. First Enoch chapter 6, verse 2 through 4. And the angels, the sons of heaven, saw and lusted after them, and they said to one another, Come, let us choose us wives from among the children of men and have children with them. And Samjaza, who was their leader, said to them, I fear. So they do fear. You will not agree to do this deed, and I alone shall have to pay the penalty for this, what does it say? Great sin. So here we see that the leader of the 200 watchers was fully aware that they were about to commit a great sin, but they went ahead and did it anyway. They took a mutual oath. They said, no, we're all in. We're, we're with you. We're going to do it. In fact, the reason Mount Hermon is called Mount Hermon is because of the mutual oath. Apparently, the word Hermon or Homon, however you pronounce it, uh, has something to do with uh, taking an oath, apparently. Uh, that's why they call it Mount Hermon. So they all went ahead and did it. Then the judgment that they feared was imposed upon them. Enoch chapter 13, verses 3 through 4 says, Then I went and spake to them all together, and they were all afraid, and fear and trembling seized them. Yes, angels do fear. And they besought me to draw up a petition for them that they might find forgiveness and to read their petition in the presence of the Lord of heaven. For from thenceforward they could not speak with him nor lift up their eyes to heaven, for shame of their sins for which they had been condemned. Let's go on. This is Enoch, 1 Enoch chapter 68. On that day, Michael answered Raphael and said, The power of the Spirit grips me and makes me tremble because of the severity of the judgment of the secrets and the judgment of the angels. Who can endure the severe judgment which has been executed and before which they melt away? And Michael answered again and said to Raphael, who would not have a softened heart concerning it? And whose mind would not be troubled by this judgment against them because of those who have led them out? So here we see both good and bad angels terrified of the severe judgment that comes from mating with human women. Now watch this. First Enoch chapter 68 verse 5 says, Therefore, all that is hidden shall come on them forever and ever. For no other angel or man shall have his portion in this judgment, but they alone have received their judgment forever and ever. Michael is prophesying that no other angel will ever be judged for this act again. Based on the context of the previous chapters and verses, the reason is because the hosts of heaven, both good and bad, saw how severe that particular act of disobedience was judged by God. God would not be just if he did not impose the same exact judgment on any other angel who committed the same act of sinning against his creation. We know that God is just, right? So he wouldn't be just if he just imposed this judgment on these 200 but didn't do it for any other angels. He would have to impose the same judgment on anybody that did it. So here we see that all the angels, good and bad, are terrified of this judgment, and Michael himself prophesies that no other angel is going to participate in this. So <laughs> I believe there's abundant evidence that there was not any other incursions. Now I've drawn up a little bit, uh, I'm a visual person so I like to depict things in charts and things like that so I can look at them vi visually. Here you see what I said earlier, the Genesis 6 experiment uh, happening at roughly 3550 BC and we see the first generation Titans, uh, Nephilim were to rule for 500 years and in that time period they were to kill each other off. And right about in the middle of their reign there Enoch is born. And then you see some really interesting things start to pop up toward the end of the 500 years. You see, first of all, the uh, Aztec calendar stone, the Mayan calendar, pops up in 3114 BC, shortly before they are the end of their time period. Then you see the death of Adam shortly thereafter. The, the first man on the planet dies. 
and roughly 20, 25 years or so after that is the end of the first generation Nephilim. The 500 years comes to an end roughly 30, 50 BC, 500 years later. That's in Enoch chapter 10, verse 10. Then we, at some point immediately afterwards or shortly thereafter, the watchers, the parents were judged and buried and put in Tartarus. And then shortly after that, Enoch is raptured. And then roughly 65 years or so after that, Noah is born, and his daddy calls him Rest. Interesting. We'll look at the names uh, a little bit more closely in a few minutes. From that point on, there is no further written documentation of any other incursions of angels mating with humans in the Bible or in the synchronized, biblically endorsed, extra-biblical text. And it's about 600 years from the time Noah was born until the flood. This brings up another interesting question. Sometimes people are confused what demons are. Some, some people think that demons are the fallen angels. That, no. Fallen angels are fallen angels. They have no need of inhabiting other people. They have bodies of their own. Who and what are demons? Well, the book of First Enoch tells us in, in chapter 15. And now the giants who are produced from the spirits and flesh shall be called evil spirits upon the earth. And on the earth shall be their dwelling. Evil spirits have proceeded from their bodies because they are born from men and from the holy watchers is their beginning and primal origin. They shall be evil spirits on the earth and evil spirits shall they be called. And it goes on to talk about that the spirits of the giants afflict, oppress, destroy, attack, do battle and work destruction on the earth and cause trouble. They take no food but nevertheless hunger and thirst and cause offenses. This is where demons come from. They are the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim. God created angels in heaven. They have an estate. So as Jude says, they left their first estate. They have a body. They operate just fine as they are. God created human beings, created animals, created the creatures of this earth. But the angel-human hybrid was something God never intended to exist in the first place. And so it's an abomination. And so when that body dies, the body of a Nephilim, the spirit has nowhere to go because it was never meant to exist in the first place. So it wanders in, in dark places and, and goes to and fro. We see that even in the New Testament with regard to some of the things that the demons talk about and how Jesus refers to them. That's the origin of demons. And uh, Dante, Minister Dante Fortson has just recently posted a blog that, uh, on the subject of demons and he uh, had some very interesting insights that I had never seen before in the Hebrew reckoning of Deuteronomy 32:17, which says, They sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom their fathers feared not. Uh, Dante goes on to say, Why did Moses refer to the demons as new gods? He goes on to use the word Elohim, which is translated as gods, Moses uses two words used specifically for real spirit beings, which are shade and Elohim. He was not simply referencing idols. If the demons are new and came newly up, what was Moses talking about? And he says there are two different words used here for the word new. Occurrence number one is Kadesh, Strong's number 2319, which means new, fresh, new thing. And the other word, Karab, Strong's 7138, Shortly, lately, near of kin. And he focuses on the phrase near of kin in his thesis. He says, these were new beings that had recently come to exist. Even more interesting is the second use, which could be translated as near of kin. If the demons did indeed come from the dead Nephilim, they would be near of kin in the sense that they were part human once. That's on ministerfortson.com. He just published that. I think it was yesterday, as a matter of fact. I said, can I borrow that? That's good. <laughs> Not an interesting insight there. Okay, so let's talk about the Genesis 6 pre-flood return of the Nephilim. Genesis 6, verse 4, says, There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that. That's the key phrase right there that causes so much um, <laughs> interesting debates for me on Facebook. Uh, because I disagree with my brothers with regard to that phrase right there. And I'll show you why in a minute. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. First thing I want to point out is Genesis is a linear book. It follows a very linear progression of events from creation to the time of the Exodus. Chronological order of events. It's not written in a non-linear fashion. He's not jumping all over the place. Second, the entire Torah is also written in a linear fashion. And Genesis 6 is entirely in a pre-flood context. 
Everything he's talking about in Genesis 6 is pre-flood. They will look at the, my colleagues who disagree with me, will look at that phrase and also after that and apply it to Numbers 13.33 and some of the other scriptures that talk about giants after the flood. I say, no, there's nothing in the text that would indicate that this is in any way jumping nonlinear all of a sudden. And I'll show you why using both the scripture itself, the Hebrew, as well as the synchronized, biblically endorsed, extra-biblical text. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same, I want to focus on that one too, became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. In Hebrew, the words that I've got highlighted there in color, giants is the word Nephilim. The word after that is interesting, it's akar, which means afterwards, after, following, subsequent. In other words, the next sequential order of events, the next thing that happened, after. When is the Hebrew word Asher, Strong's number 834, uh, translated here as when, but more often is translated as because. In fact, 73 times it is translated as the word because versus 44 times as when. Why is that important? Well, if you change that word to because, then all of a sudden it becomes a first cause issue as opposed to a repeat offense issue. They will use that word when and also whenever and say, see, whenever they decide to have sex, they had produced Nephilim again and again and again and again, whenever they wanted to do it. I say, no, it's a first cause issue, not a repeat offense issue. Now, mighty men is the Hebrew word gaborim, which can sometimes mean giant, not always. It just simply means mighty men. A giant would certainly be a mighty man. Would you agree? <laughs> but David's mighty men were also strong people, but they weren't Nephilim. They were busy killing Nephilim, so it's the same word. I believe you have to really take that word in context, uh, how it's being used. <laughs> of old, where it says that they became, the same became mighty men which were of old, that's the Hebrew word olam, Strong's number 5769. This word means the very distant past. It is translated elsewhere as everlasting 110 times and as forever 136 times. It's not as in old days like, you know, a few hundred years ago. This is talking so far back, it's, we could barely remember it. And he says, the same became those guys. All right? So, if I were to expand Genesis 6-4, based on the interpretation of the Hebrew I just showed you, I would say it's saying, there were giants, or Nephilim, in the earth in those days, that being the days of Jared. And also after that, that being the days after the first generation Nephilim were killed off, but still before the flood, when or because of the fact that the sons of God came in or entered, inserted their seed unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same from the pre-flood after that, became mighty men which were of old, long, long, long ago, men of renown. And I uh, recently saw that the Dewey Rhymes Bible seems to support this thesis as well. The Dewey Rhymes Bible came out pretty much the same time as the King James Bible came out. It was uh, the Catholic's answer to the Protestant Reformation. The Dewey Rhymes Bible renders Genesis 6-4 as, Now giants were upon the earth in those days, for after the sons of God went in to the daughters of men, and they brought forth children, these are the mighty men of old, men of renown. Synchronizing the text. This is where, a re as soon as I started to understand, just in my, like I said, I tried to clear my own slate and look at the stuff just as, as freshly as possible. Clean slate, start from scratch, God, show me what's going on. And, and right off the bat, I, I really started to question the multiple incursion theory because I could find no confirming scriptures for it. So then I said, well, Lord, then how did they come back? If they didn't come back through multiple incursions, how did they come back? And as I looked through the synchronized, biblically endorsed, extra biblical text, the story became crystal clear. You see, in Genesis 6, 1 through 4, angels mating with humans. That syncs up with the references you see there in Enoch and Jubilees. Genesis 6, 5 through 7. Uh, shows how God feels about the resulting violence that took place, and you see what syncs up with that. Genesis 6, 8 through 10 reveals how Noah and his sons were genetically pure, and if I was to get really dogmatic about it, Scripture actually only says that Noah was pure. It, it doesn't say anything about the rest of his family. It only says Noah was pure. Now, uh, looking through some of the extra-biblical texts there, it says that Noah took his wife from, uh, his wife's name was Nema, and she was the daughter of Enoch. Well, looking at Enoch's track record, I think she grew up in a godly home. Would you agree? <laughs> uh, he was so godly, God said, hey, come home with me. Uh, so I, I think it's a reasonable assumption based on the context of what I know about Enoch, if in fact Nama was his daughter, to assume, it is an assumption, that she was pure as well. But I admit that it is an assumption. 
If it is true that both Noah and his wife were pure, then it stands to reason that Shem, Ham, and Japheth, all three, were also pure. Correct? So I'm going with that premise, that they were all pure. Genesis 6, 11 through 12, says that earth and all flesh becomes corrupted, and that syncs up with the text that you see there. Genesis 6, 13 through 17 says, God grows increasingly angry and tells Noah to build the ark and shows him how to do it. And you see the text that syncs up with that. Now here's the first mention of the wives of Noah's sons, Genesis 6, 18. And if we're following a chronological order of events, then the three wives don't show up until after Genesis 6, 12, which was the corruption of all flesh. How, how much is all? All is all. It's a stain lifter, that's all. <laughs> Just popped on my head, I don't know why. <laughs> so, uh, if the wives weren't chosen until Genesis, after Genesis 6, 12, then they fall into the category of all flesh becoming corrupted. Tainted seed could have entered the ark through them. Now, my detractors would say, that's absurd. Why would God destroy the whole earth and just to let tainted seed go through the ark? Well, let's think about that for a second. What, what are, what are we, we're talking about genes here, okay? We're talking about microscopic uh, codes in somebody's DNA that would later get wiped out, completely obliterated by Israel's sword. No problem there. They get all upset about that, saying, well, that doesn't make any sense. Why would God allow, if he's going to destroy the world because of, of, of corrupted seed, why would he allow corrupted seed or, or genetics to enter the ark? And I say, you're focusing on the symptom. I believe God doesn't focus on the symptom. I believe God focuses on the root cause. Because it is far more absurd to say that if the corrupted seed came as a result of watchers mating with women, for God to go ahead and allow that to happen again immediately after the flood. It's just going to create tainted seed again, all over again. So either way, whether you agree with me or whether you agree with them, you have a tainted seed issue to deal with. You have a genetic problem. In my case, it's just simply carrying forward through a couple of individuals. In their case, it's, it's, and, and in my case, I'm submitting that it's multiple generations le later of diluted Nephilim seed. First generation Nephilim were killed off in 500 years. I told you there's 1,200 years total, right? So that's what, 700 years left or so? In that time, of course, the 500 years the first generation lived, they had offspring as well. And they had offspring, and they had offspring, and they had offspring. So I believe we're talking about diluted Nephilim genetics by the time we get to the flood. That are, uh, and that, I believe, also explains why the giants are significantly shorter in the post-flood world. But they would subscribe to the idea that angels mated with women again and produced first-generation Nephilim again and again and again, causing potent seed problems. So we both have a genetic issue to deal with there. So let's continue. Genesis 6.12 is the one that I keep bringing up. All flesh had become corrupted. All flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. J Joshua 4.18 and Jubilees 7.24 really elaborate on what is being said in Genesis 6.12. Joshua 4.18 says, and they're judges and rulers, and there's some debate as to what that is. Are, are those men or are those angels? I don't have the Hebrew or the Greek to look at to verify what words were used, translated into judges and rulers. I suspect that it may be the same words used in Ephesians for archons, rulers. If that's true, then this could be talking about angels right here. But even if it's not, even if it's talking about people, it, it, it still works for me. Because according to Enoch, the first generation uh, Nephilim were killed in 500 years and the watchers were judged and buried immediately thereafter. But in that 500 years, they taught men all kinds of bad things. So even if these are men, they're working under the premise and under the knowledge that was given to them by the watchers before them. So these individuals went to the daughters of men and took their wives by force from their husbands according to their choice. And the sons of men in those days took from the cattle of the earth and the beasts of the field and the fowls of the air and taught the mixture of animals of one species with the other in order therewith to provoke the Lord. And God saw the whole earth and it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted its way upon the earth, all men and all animals. So Joshua is elaborating on what was going on in Genesis chapter 6, verse 12. How did all flesh become corrupted? Because men started mixing animals and humans together. What did Jesus say? As it was in the days of Noah. Have any of you been watching the news lately? What have we been hearing about? And animal human chimeras. 150 of them in Europe last year in the UK. They announced 150 animal human hybrids were produced. That's what we know about. That's what they're telling us about. Imagine what's taking place in secret laboratories or in the military. 
exactly as it was in the days of Noah. Do we read anything in the news about angels mating, mating with humans? I haven't read anything about angels mating with humans. Have you? Well, they're mixing species. Jubilees says, and, and this is where Jubilees knocks the home run for me where, with regard to the after that of Genesis 6-4, because he uses the same phrase. And after this, after what? After the watchers were judged and buried and after the first generation of them were killed, they sinned against the beasts and birds and all that moveth and walketh on the earth. And much blood was shed on the earth and every imagination and desire of men imagined vanity and evil continually, which is also a parallel to something we read in Genesis about their, everything in their hearts was evil continually. That's what's going on when you look at the, the, the story in, in each of the synchronized biblical texts uh, going, uh, filling in the blanks, so to speak, of Genesis chapter 6. Sinned against the animals, what does that mean? Sinned against the animals is a reference to genetic manipulation, which created the animal-human hybrids of mythology, which appears to have also made a way for the disembodied spirits. Remember we talked about that, that the demons, where they came from, they, they're the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim, to have host bodies to once again inhabit, thus bringing about their return. Dr. Judd Burton uh, has become a good friend of mine in, in recent months. I just met him. Uh, have, I've had him on my radio show a few times, and uh, we talk by phone quite a bit. He's written an extraordinary little book here called Interview with the Giant. Uh, I highly recommend you check it out. You can get it on lulu.com, Interview with the Giant. He quote, this is a quote from his book. He said, despite the loss of their physical bodies from dying in the flood, there is reason to believe that the giants, spirits, continue to exist. In this state, they were and are demonic entities. Like other sentient creatures, they have an eternal spirit at their essence. Therefore, the Nephilim and related tribes of giants never really ceased to exist. Only their physicality was lost. So if they're out there wandering around as disembodied spirits, they want a body back. Well, they, what if the creation of something God never intended to exist provides that opportunity? Because God created, Paul talks about that there's a spirit for, for man, there's a spirit for animals, there's a flesh for, for angels, a flesh for man, right? Paul talks about that. Well, God never created a provision for this. He never wanted it to exist. So what kind of spirit would enter that? I think it's a reasonable assumption to say the only spirit fit to enter that are the disembodied spirits that were corrupt to begin with. I believe that's plan B. If no other angel is going to risk the severity of the judgment, and they still wanted to mess with man, how are they going to do it? Plan B, mix animals with humans. Here's an expanded version of the timeline I showed you earlier. This is, I believe, what happened in the latter days of Methuselah in the last 120 years leading up to the flood. You have everything I talked about earlier, the, the death of the Nephilim, the judgment of the watchers, Enoch's rapture, Noah being called rest, Noah's born, and then you have this latter-day corruption of all flesh that's spoken about, spoken about in detail in the synchronized, biblically endorsed, extra-biblical text. You see there, I've got a dinosaur depicted. The question often comes up, where did the dinosaurs come from? Uh, who created the dinosaurs? This is my theory. Uh, I believe it's supported by scripture. Job chapter 40. And I always look, when I'm looking at translations of the Bible, I always look for this passage right here, Job chapter 40, to see how the translator translated this particular verse. It's, uh, King James says, Behold now behemoth. Some of the more modern translations will render that as hippopotamus or maybe elephant or something. No, keep reading. <laughs> if you look at the description of this behemoth creature, you see what I have bold right there. He moveth his tail like a cedar tree. Have you ever seen the tail of a hippo? Does that fit a cedar tree? <laughs> come, on, come on, guys, seriously? No, I think this description in Job, that's why when I look at some of the modern translations, I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. If you've got one of those Bibles that refers to this as a hippo, that's a good place for a Sharpie right in there. No. Behemoth, let's stick with that one. I believe Behemoth is referring to this creature right here. And God's proud of this thing. Look what God says. He talks about his bones are like bars of iron. He is, he is the chief of the ways of God. God's bragging about this thing. He's like, look at that. As 145 foot of Patasaurus is walking by. Not a hippopotamus. All right. Okay, so if that's the case, let's say goodbye to the hippo. Bye-bye, hippo. I believe God created the vegetarian, the herbivore classes of dinosaur, the, the friendly vegetarian dinosaurs I believe God created. And I think the evidence for that, again, looking for evidence, I, I see this in Scripture, but I see this in history. 
The, the, this is a stegosaurus there carved a, in a temple in Cambodia in recent history, you know, a few hundred years, maybe a thousand or whatever years, I don't know how old it is. Uh, down at the bottom there, you see uh, rock drawings and cave drawings and stuff. You, you often see dinosaurs depicted with man. But you notice what kind of dinosaur it is. Herbivore, vegetarian. There are several different, and these are just a few, there are a lot more out there. I recently interviewed Dr. Aaron Judkins uh, on my radio show. He's a, another guy very similar to Dr. Judd Burton. Uh, he actually has a, a, a fossil track named after him that he discovered, one of the longest contiguous fossil, fossilized footprints of, uh, of dinosaur tracks uh, in uh, Paluxy, down there in uh, Glenrose. And uh, he, he was there and saw the dinosaur tracks. If you've ever been down there at the Creation Science Museum uh, and taken a walk down the Paluxy, you can see human footprints right side by side, sometimes stepping inside dinosaur tracks. So yes, humans and dinosaurs did live together no matter what the evolutionists try to tell you. It is true. The only way this is possible is that they got through the flood. How did they get through the flood? There's only one way because it says the flood covered the highest mountains of the world. This was not a localized flood, it was a global flood which is why you have fossils in the first place. <laughs> How do you get a fossil? You gotta bury it with a lot of mud and a lot of pressure to fossilize the thing. You know, if this thing just fell by the side, of the evolutionists would tell you this thing died, fell over by the side of a creek, uh, and then somehow became fossilized. No, the other guys come along and eat it. Have you ever seen roadkill fossilized? No, you see roadkill and it's shortly either eaten by ants or whatever, uh, you know, it gets, nature takes care of it. The only way it's gonna get fossilized is to very quickly get covered by an awful lot of water. That explains why we have fossils in the first place, a global flood. So I think Noah, being 600 years old, probably was smart enough to bring maybe a baby version of these on board. He's not going to, hey, 145 footer, 145 footer, beep, 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 come on, a little, little to the left, a little to the left. No, come on, let's be realistic. But I believe that they did survive the flood. Okay, so uh, what about uh, this guy here? Where did that guy come from? I don't think that was created by God, personally. I believe that, again, Scripture helps us out here. Genesis 6, 12, and 13. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Do you think that thing creates a little bit of violence? I think so. I think that fits. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. First Enoch 7, 5. They, the Nephilim, began to sin against beasts, uh, birds, beasts, reptiles, and fish. Jubilees 5, 2. Men and cattle and beasts and birds and everything that walked on the earth were all corrupt. How much is all? All is all. Okay. All were corrupted in their ways and in their orders, and they began to devour each other. That's a violent devourer right there. I believe that was genetically engineered from existing lizards that God created, existing dinosaurs that God created. I believe that's an abomination just like the satyrs, the minotaurs, uh, and all the other uh, hybrids that we see in mythology. I told you we'd talk about the names a little bit. The names, it, there's an, probably the best $5 I ever spent is this, on this little book right here. $5. This, this book is a dictionary of scripture proper names. All it does is give you the names that are, you find in scripture and the Hebrew definition of what the names mean. We know that their names have meaning. Like Abraham, right? He's, what's, his, what's Abraham's name mean? father of milts, the father of many nations. You know, we've heard that. So when Abraham walked up to and introduced himself, basically what he was saying is, hi, I'm the father of many nations. His name had a meaning, right? Uh, so this is a book about the names and the meanings that they have. Well, Dr. Chuck Missler looked at the 10 patriarchs prior to the flood and looked at the definition of their names and realized, wow, this actually spells out a, a little paragraph here that actually tells God's whole plan for humanity. <laughs> Amazing, in the names of the patriarchs. You see the names right there in the column, what each person's name means, putting it in a sentence. Dr. Chuck Missler writes, man is appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down teaching that his death shall bring the despairing rest. There's the gospel salvation message right there in the names of the pre-flood patriarchs. Wow. Well, I started to look at that, uh, look into that a little bit deeper. Why is Jared's name shall come down? Well, because the synchronized extra biblical text will, will testify to the fact that that's when the watchers came down in Genesis chapter 6. They came down in the days of Jared. They descended. And so here's, here's this guy's name is shall descend. 
Enoch was a teacher of righteousness. Well, his name, he taught against the watchers. That's what the whole book of Enoch is about, him teaching against the, the activity of the watchers. Methuselah, Enoch's son. Uh, Enoch got revelation that God was going to destroy the world, and it would happen at the end of his son's life. And so his son is named, his death shall bring, and the connotation is judgment. So with, and sure enough, seven days after Methuselah's death, the floodwaters came. Lamech was named despairing because he was born during the time period of the first generation Nephilim. That would certainly make sense. If you look at all the corruption, the violence, and all the horrors that's going around, you would be despairing. He named his son despairing. But then what happens? All of this stuff that I showed you, the 500 uh, years ended, the first generation Nephilim were gone, the watchers were buried, all of that has, was done away with, and then Lamech names his son <sighs> Rest. Noah was born after the first generation situation. Let's look at it as a picture. Look at all the chaos that took place in the beginning there. Look at when it came to the end. You could see Noah was named Rest because there was an end of that corruption. And there was a period of peace for a little while until you get to the last 120 years. The reason I focus on the last 120 years is because I believe that's what God is saying when he said, my spirit will no longer dwell with man, for his days shall be 120 years. I believe that was when God was saying, okay, you better stop doing what you're doing. I'm going to give you some time to repent. And clearly they didn't, and things got worse and worse and worse until Genesis 6.12 manifested all flesh becoming corrupted. That's what I believe is happening there. Changing man's nature. This is a little nugget just recently read in Jubilees chapter 5. And their fathers, the watchers, were witnesses of their, their, the first generation Nephilim destruction. And after this, they were bound in the depths of the earth forever until the day of the great condemnation when judgment is executed on all those who have corrupted their ways and their works before the Lord. And he destroyed all from their places. And there was not left one of them whom he judged not according to all their wickedness. And he made for all his works a new and righteous nature so that they should not sin in their whole nature forever, but should be all righteous, each in his kind always. Could this have been a preventative measure to prevent or to ensure that angels and humans could no longer breed via sex? I think so. And the um, translator of this particular edition of Jubilees, uh, Joseph B. Lumpkin, has a little footnote on this. He says, as far as this author is aware, the recreation of man's nature is mentioned in no other book. This idea of human nature being altered as it existed before the flood is found nowhere else but in Jubilees. And I would disagree with him because as I looked at that, I thought, okay, remember my, what I said? I need two witnesses before I can hang a truth on it. I looked at what he, what he had to say right there, and I looked at that verse, and immediately Daniel 2.43 jumped into my head. And I'm just throwing this out there. Maybe this is confirmation of this idea that, that God changed man's nature such that angels and humans couldn't mate anymore, that there was a barrier put in place. Maybe that's why plan B had to be instituted. Just putting it out there. Daniel 2.43. And whereas thou saw iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Who's they? <laughs> Who's this they mingling with men? The seed of men. But they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Cleave is a marriage term. For two coming together and becoming one. We see that many times in Scripture, multiple confirmations of that. So I'm just throwing it out there. I'm thinking Daniel 2.43 may be a confirmation of what this is saying in Jubilees chapter 5. The days of Jared versus the days of Noah. Because what did Jesus say? As it was in the days of Noah. The days of Jared were marked by the mating of angels and humans. Whereas, however, it was in the days of Noah that the creation of animal-human hybrids brought about the corruption of all flesh we read about in Genesis 6.12, which ultimately led to God's judgment with the flood. So if I were to take Jesus' words in Matthew 24.37 quite literally, all we need to do is turn on the evening news. <laughs> there we're seeing a repeat not of angels mating with humans, as in the days of Jared, but rather the recreation of animal-human hybrids exactly as it was in the days of Noah. There's a couple of books that recently came out by Douglas Hamp and Tom Anita Horn. And I just found it kind of poetic as I was putting this presentation together. Just put these two books side by side. I believe the corrupting of the image of God. God created man in what? His own image, right? 
When we corrupt that image, we are opening forbidden gates. And that's what these two books are about, corrupting the image and opening up forbidden gates. That's what was taking place in the pre-flood world. Who or what are Nephilim? I think we need to define the Nephilim. We've been talking a lot about them. Strong's number 5303 defines uh, them as Nephil. Now, Nephilim, when you add the I am, some of you are taking Hebrew classes uh, with Sheila and I. We were taking Hebrew classes. We learned that the suffix I am is what? Plural. So this is the plural form. Uh, it comes from the word Nephal. Properly, uh, Nephilim would be defined as a feller, i.e. a bully or tyrant, a giant. Do you see anything in that definition that says exclusively a Nephilim is the offspring of angels made with humans? No. He's a bully. He's a tyrant. He comes from the word Nephal. He's a plural form of Nephal. Well, what does Nephal mean? Nephal, as strong as number 5307, has a, a number of meanings. Some of them are cast down, cease, die, divide by lot, let fail, to fall. That's the one everybody likes to focus on, to fall. But it's got a lot of meanings. Uh, fugitive, inferior, be judged, perish, rot, slay, smite out, throw down. This word is actually used 435 times in the Bible. Only very few of those times is it in reference to the offspring of angels and humans. So I would submit that I think we need to have a broader idea of, of what a Nephilim is. There's nothing in the, in the word itself that defines it exclusively as the offspring of angels made with humans. So with that premise, I started to think, well, if I could think of this in broader terms, let's think of some of the possibilities. Here are some of the other uses for that word Nephal in Scripture. The first time is in Genesis 2.21, where God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam when he created Eve. So what is that? Did, did Adam become a Nephilim? No. It's just simply the word to fall. Okay, in Numbers 5.21, it says, When the Lord doth make thy thigh to rot, the phrase to rot, that comes from the fall, and thy belly to swell. In Numbers 6.12, But the days that are, were before shall be lost. Same word, nephal, because the separation was defiled. In short, a nephal, im, is essentially one who falls, rots, and shall be lost, <laughs> according to this. I would just say it's something that has fallen or is less than what God originally created it to be. God created us in his image perfect. When we start corrupting that, you got a nephal. You got a nephilim. Something that is corrupted. So, derived from the word nephal, nephilim are often said to be fallen ones, but we just know, we just, I just showed you there's a broader way to look at that. Some associate the nephilim with being the fallen angels themselves based on that one definition of to fall. Uh, I say not so because Genesis 6 says that the nephilim were the offspring of the fallen angels. So I don't believe the nephilim are the fallen angels. Put more simply, Nephilim can be defined as those who are fallen from their original state the way God created them to be. Which brings up a question. Can Nephilim be produced in other ways besides being the offspring of angels? Obviously, I think the answer is yes. Based on the variety of meanings for the word itself, but also based on the story that is evolving and that is coming, about, uh, coming to light as we look at all these texts combined together, I believe that there are other ways to create Nephilim. So let's consider this. Created in whose image? We were created in the image of God, right? Genesis 1, 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. We are created in the image of God. I credit this uh, insight to my wife, what I'm about to show you, about the possibility that the angels may have been trying to create something in their image. There's a variety of angels described in the Bible. You've got cherubim and seraphim and archangels and watchers. There's all kinds of different classes of angels apparently in heaven. You've got one class of angel described in Ezekiel 1, 5 through 10, where it describes a heavenly being saying that it had a likeness of a man. So here's this, this angelic being that looks like a man, but the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot. Well, wait a minute. Now all of a sudden you got a picture in your head of a, a satyr, something that's got part man, but got hooves on the bottom. Uh, it describes that this individual, these creatures, had uh, the hands of a man under wings. So now we know this thing has wings. And then it goes on to say that its head has four faces. It has the face of a man, the face of a lion, the face of an ox, and the face of an eagle. This is an animal-human hybrid coming out of heaven. 
But this is something God created. This is, this is a class of angel, whatever kind of being this is. God created this. This is the wheel within the wheel story where, where these beings come down. So if this is what some of the angels may look like, could it be that they were trying to recreate themselves, create something in their image, in their likeness, which is why they're mixing animals and humans together? Uh, just think about the implications of that. Now, would that create a host body that fits their angel-human hybrid demonic spirits to enter? I, I think the answer is yes. There's a movie that recently came out called Splice. I don't recommend you see it. It's a very disturbing movie. You'll, it just don't, trust me, don't go see it. Very disturbing movie. But sometimes I like seeing the special features even more than the movie itself. And uh, the only reason I looked at this movie is because of the research that I'm doing. Um, the special features had a documentary where the director is talking about what their idea was behind this creature that they call Dren. Dren is the name of the animal-human hybrid that they create. Listen to what he has to say and to what their, their goal was when they were creating Dren. Listen to what he has to say, what they were trying to do with the creation of Dren. Heart rate stable. Splice is about uh, two young, brilliant scientists, played by Adrian Brody and Sarah Pauly. And uh, what they do is create hybrid organisms by splicing DNA from different species for a large pharmaceutical company. But they're young, and they're ambitious. And what they really want to do is add human DNA to the mix. But the company objects to this, so they do it in secret. And then terrible, terrible things result. You can't let her out. Specimens need to be contained. Don't call her that. Part of the excitement of watching this film is not knowing what Dren will ultimately become because she evolves in her life cycle. She evolves in a very radical way. And, uh, and she actually begins as, as something quite ugly, a, a creature or a child that only a mother could love. But as she grows, she turns into something quite beautiful, something that is possibly a step up on the evolutionary ladder. I always thought of Dren as a genetically engineered angel. So, so she was always going to have a kind of bird component to her, and she was always intended to have wings, and there was always going to be something delicate and beautiful about her, and something, you know, maybe that's more beautiful than a human being. There is a sexual component to this story. There's a sexual component to the relationship between the scientist and the creature that's about as Freudian as you can get. You crossed the line. What did you expect when you made it? Didn't you have a plan? The prime directive of any life form is to procreate, and when you create something like Dren, that's an aspect of her being that you're going to have to address. And I think what's so wonderful about the horror genre is that it gives you license to go to places that you could never comfortably go with a normal film. Become unstable. This is the disaster everyone warns about. A new species set loose in the world. I mean, this film, on some level, is about well, in many, on many levels, is about evolution. It's about how Dren grows up. In some respect, it's about how we as a species are growing up or evolving. And I'm almost certain that, given what's going on with this technology, that we are going to play a hand in our own evolution. Did you hear what he said? We're trying to create a genetically engineered angel. How interesting that even in the secular world, that there's a concept of what, what I'm talking about here. Could it be that these writers who are making these horrific films are actually channeling <laughs> some of the things the fallen angels are, may want them to portray? Could be. I find it interesting in this movie what he's, what he's, he's talked about, how this creature develops. It starts off, they, they create an animal-human hybrid. It starts off as a very alien-looking creature in the beginning. It begins to morph into sort of a baby-looking creature, toddler, adolescent, and eventually uh, an adult female. They try to make her look really sexy. But by the end of the movie, she morphs into a he, becomes a male genetically engineered angel. And they say right off the bat, our goal was to create an angel, a genetically engineered angel. Just putting it out there, I think that's exactly what was going on in the pre-flood world prior to the days of, of the flood right here in the latter-day corruption of all flesh. That's what I think happened with the pre-flood return of the Nephilim. Now let's transition into the post-flood return of the Nephilim. When you look at the post-flood world, boy, this is Lord of the Rings territory. This is Narnia. 
this is all the fantasy films that we've seen with uh, the crazy giants and, and incredible battles and stuff. This stuff really happened. As I started looking at the scriptures, man, we're not taught this in Sunday school. We're not taught this in church, but when you, like I said, you plug in the Nephilim equation into this whole thing and you take the scriptures literally and stop trying to make it all an allegory, a metaphor, a symbol, symbolic. Wow, there's a lot of stuff going on there. So you see what I've already depicted in the latter half. This is part of a chart that I'm creating. Uh, you see at the top I have two, day two and three. Remember where scripture says that a, a day with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day? I went with that premise to create a chart. Uh, so at the bottom there you see 2,000, 3,000, and there's another part of that for day one. And so I'm building a seven day chart for 7,000 years of human history. And I'm trying to fill in all the blanks of the stuff that I see going on in scripture in a visual format. This is day two and three. So you got the, the, the latter part of day two is where you, you have the corruption of all flesh, you have the flood, and then roughly 100, 150 years after the flood, you have the creation of the Tower of Babel. Uh, and that whole deal, Nimrod's born, but you see you got this giant right there, uh, it's right, his foot standing on the flood. That's uh, right after the flood. I would depict him as Amorius, the, the father of the Amorites, son of Canaan. And after that, he's got sons, Arba, Anak, uh, the giants start to fill up the land. The Israelites are going in there, and they're fighting wars against giants. I mean, this is Lord of the Rings, cool stuff. You want to get your teenager excited about the scriptures? <laughs> there it is. And it's real. So, uh, as I started to look at instances uh, that may be pointing towards uh, post-flood Nephilim, I found a few of these that, that uh, I'm going to highlight here for you. Post-flood accounts of Arphaxad's son, Canaan. We'll start with him. Arphaxad was one of the sons of Shem. Uh, I found this nugget in Jubilees 8, verses 1 through 5. In the 29th Jubilee, in the first week, in the beginning thereof, Arphaxad, who is Shem's son, took to himself a wife, and her name was Ras Uija, something like that, the daughter of Susan, the daughter of Shem's son Elam, and she bare him a son in the third year in this week, and he called his name Canaan. And the son grew, and his father, Arphax said, taught him writing, and he went to seek for himself a place where he might seize for himself a city. And there he found a writing which former generations had carved on the rock, and he read what was thereon, and he translated it and sinned owing to it, for it contained the teaching of the watchers. So here we have Shem's son uh, producing a son. He teaches him how to read and write, and he goes out to go build a city, and while he's out there, he finds some writing from the pre-flood world that was apparently written or contained the knowledge of the watchers. And he did whatever it had to say, apparently. And uh, he says there at the bottom, uh, and he wrote it down and said nothing regarding it, for he was afraid to speak to Noah about it, lest he should be angry with him on account of it. Yeah, you think Noah would be a little bit upset? What are you doing? We just came off this boat thing, remember? <laughs> it wasn't that long ago. Woo! So here we got this very peculiar situation happening there. Now, I will say this about this particular character, Canaan, is uh, we don't find him in the lineage of Genesis 10. So I, I don't know what to do with it. Either throw Jubilees out and say it's garbage, or maybe Jubilees is giving you the reason why he was excluded from uh, the, the uh, patriarchs there in Genesis 10. Just throwing it out there. It's just a story that I found. Take it for whatever you think it's worth. Canaan. Now, of course, we do read a lot about him and his descendants in the scriptures. Canaan, his lineage is given in Genesis 10, verses 15 through 19. These are the ites, all the different ites that the, is the children of Israel constantly had to deal with. And by that, I mean kill. This is where God says, go into that village, go into that city, kill the women and children, the animals, the men, kill everything. These guys. Mizraim, he has a uh, son named Kaftor, and that's given in Genesis chapter 10, verses 13 and 14, who settled the island of Crete and was the father of the Philistines. And uh, confirming witnesses for that are Jeremiah 47, 4 and Amos 9, 7. Identifies Kaftor as the father of the Philistines. We know of some giants with, uh, that came from that group of people, don't we? Goliath and his brothers, right? We also know... Uh, by reading history and reading some of the mythologies of other cultures that really all of Greek mythology came from this place. So could it be that the Greek gods, the myth of the Greek gods are actually all based on the offspring of this individual here? The evidence seems to suggest so. Cush, he married his daughter Semiramis. 
So at some point, his wife <laughs> gave birth to Semiramis, and then he later married her, and the, that union produced Nimrod, whom he named, this is interesting, hey, let's name our son, We Shall Rebel. What do you think? <laughs> and he named his son the rebellious one. He just, he, how, he, didn't have, how, he didn't have time to rebel. He was just born. He names the kid the rebellious one. Well, what, what do you do with that, <laughs> right? And scripture tells us that Nimrod began to be a mighty one in the earth. That's that word Giborim again, Gabor. He began to be a Gabor. Now, we can look at that and say, well, Nimrod simply became a strong and powerful man. He just became a, a tough guy. Or we could say that Nimrod began to become a giant himself. Or we could say Nimrod began to become a hunter of giants when you look at that text. I would suggest that you could take all three to be true. I believe all three of those are true. The Septuagint just kind of clarifies it all for you. And I lean towards the Septuagint's version of this because this is a lot closer to the original source material. I mean, if you look at when the Septuagint was written, this was written by Hebrews who spoke and read Greek. They had the original subject matter. They are a lot closer to the original subject matter than King Jimmy's boys were. A lot closer. And so they said right off the bat, he began to be a giant. <laughs> so I'm going to go with that. Okay. I think scripture testifies that Nimrod became a giant. Uh, and that is confirmed by numerous other sources when you get outside and, and look at the cultures of other people. And, and I talk about that extensively in some of my other materials uh, in the back there. This is from an episode of Fringe, just fairly recent episode. I, 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 my wife and I enjoy Fringe. Uh, listen to what they say. That they're, this, they're analyzing the body of an animal-human hybrid that they discovered. They found an animal-human hybrid, and they're checking it out. And uh, listen to what they have to say, but think about Nimrod, because it says that he began to be a Gaborim, and I believe the context there for Gaborim is giant. So he began to be a Nephilim or an offspring of the Nephilim, a Gaborim. He began to be a giant. I'm thinking this episode of Fringe just tells you how that may have happened. So with that in mind. You see these? they track marks. We think he was injecting himself with whatever that stuff is. What's that? Just here. Huh. It looks like a tattoo. Hey, Walter. Hmm? You come here for a sec, take a look at this. Okay, well, if Conrad's not behind this, who is? Perhaps the Sumerians. This tattoo. This cuneiform. I'm not sure of the significance of the symbol, but I'm fairly certain it's Sumerian. Yep, I was right. Here it is. I remember reading it means renewal or rebirth. There's been some rumblings lately about a group out there. A cult, really. As far as I can see, they're just whack jobs. <laughs> they're obsessed with the guided evolution of man. They want to create a new species, a better species. Mutation by design. This should be the last one. <laughs> Just think how special you're going to be. How special we're both going to be. Like Adam and Eve. Walter? Take a look at this. Oh my. In the Department of Guided Evolution. This is indeed a great leap forward. Love fringe. <laughs> uh, wow. <laughs> in, 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 Using retroviral DNA, they're rewriting people's genome. And they're talking about the Sumerians there and the Assyrians and all that stuff. What, what Nimrod? That fits Nimrod, doesn't it? He's an Assyrian, right? Sumerian culture, all of that mythology and stuff. I talk a lot more about Nimrod uh, becoming uh, Gaborim. Nimrod began to be. And, and these materials right here, of course, my whole Babylon Rising series there in book, DVD, and audio book as well as my DVD, The um, Mythology and the Coming Great Deception. I, I give a lot more detail there, so I'm not going to go into it here. But I think that Fringe episode may help us understand what may have happened in the post-flood world, maybe even with Canaan as well. Maybe that's what Canaan discovered, discovered, whatever that writing was on the rock, how to do some of these things. I don't know, just putting it out there. 
But with regard to Nimrod being a giant and also a hunter of giants, as I started to look into Baalbek, uh, I found some things that would confirm that notion, I believe. Again, looking for more than one witness. The history of Baalbek reaches back, uh, and Baalbek is like in Lebanon, the region there. The history of Baalbek reaches back approximately 5,000 years. Excavations beneath the great court of the Temple of Jupiter have uncovered traces of settlements dating to the Middle Bronze Age, 1900 to 1600 BC, built on top of an older level of human habitation dating to the Early Bronze Age, 2900 to 2300 BC, which makes it roughly contemporary to the Tower of Babel. The Baalbek was built about the same time or shortly thereafter uh, the time of the Tower of Babel. And I found this quote from an individual by the name of Michael Alouf, page 41 of his book, History of Baalbek. He says, after the flood, when Nimrod reigned over Lebanon, he sent giants to rebuild the fortress of Baalbek, which was so named in honor of Baal, the god of the Moabites and worshipers of the sun. See that stone right there? That thing is huge. Uh, you can see the size comparison of the guy that's standing there. That's roughly a six-foot-tall man standing on the end of that stone right there. Now, uh, modern historians and archaeologists will look at that and scratch their head and go, oh, uh, we don't have any clue. How in the world did somebody quarry that rock? How did they carve that rock? How did they move that rock? Nobody can understand that when you're trying to look at it with that frame of mind. Six-foot-tall guy. Looking at our resources today, we couldn't move something that big. Baalbek in particular is a very good example. That has the trilophon. Those are the largest stones in the world ever used for construction. They're so large we don't even know their actual weight. Now, those stones were somehow quarried, moved five miles, lifted 25, 30 feet in the air, and placed together so closely that you can't fit a razor blade or a piece of paper in between them. We have no idea how they did it. We don't have a crane in the world that can lift weights anywhere near what those things are. But if we let the scriptures speak for us, I believe this solves the problem. <laughs> Amos 2.9, God describes the Amorites. Yet I destroyed the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of the cedar trees, like the height of the cedars. And he was strong as the oaks. Yet I destroyed his fruit from above and his roots from beneath. Cedar trees start at 35 feet and go up to 150 feet. The cedars of Lebanon, we're in Baalbek, Lebanon, <laughs> where they're known for their cedar trees. Amos describes... The giants, the Amorites. So I scaled Arnold Schwarzenegger up to a 35-foot person, 36-footer, and there's what you got. You imagine two guys like Arnold, strong as the oaks, right? Now, that's pretty easy to see how that rock was moved. <laughs> hey, Arnold, stop flexing. Get over here and give me a hand. <laughs> stop showing off for the camera. I need some help here. <laughs> that totally explains the megalithic structures all around the world. Let the scripture speak for itself. It tells you there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that. That being before the flood, yes, and also after the flood as well. Just not by multiple incursions. <laughs> Josephus, historian, also describes giants. They were, till then, left the race of giants who had bodies so large and countenances so entirely different from other men that they were surprising to the sight and terrible to the hearing. These were horrific creatures. Josephus writes about these as a historian in the first century. And he actually says that the bones of these men are still on open display at his, in his day. So apparently they had a little museum of the conquered giants that the Israelites wiped out. Here's, you know, here's, here's the bones of the giants right here for everybody to see. All post-flood giants in the Bible are referred to as offspring of other giants found in the lineage of Canaan, Mizraim, Cush, and possibly Japheth. And I put in parentheses there Gog and Magog. I can't confirm this from Scripture. I don't have scriptural confirmation for this. However, historically speaking, there's a lot of evidence that uh, Gog and Magog were giants. In fact, every year they have what's called the Lord Mayor Parade in the UK where they march these two huge giants called Gog and Magog through the cities. Two big giants. I stood on the Great Wall of China in 2006. Come to find out that the original name for the Great Wall of China was the Ramparts of Magog. And so when you stand on this massive wall, I mean, this thing's huge and it goes on forever. That's not just to keep out Joe Blow's six footer out. It makes sense that they may have been trying to keep out a whole bunch of, you know, 35 footers maybe or whatever. Uh, but there's evidence that Gog and Magog may have indeed been giants. God wiped these giants out with Israel's sword. Now, I got another little chart here for you. I love my charts. 
This shows the, the various uh, timelines for each of the patriarchs there, how long they lived. Uh, you see the, the X there on the lower left, the Genesis 6 experiment takes place. You see how long it was to the flood, Nephilim on the earth for about 1,200 years up to the flood. About midway or so, you see around, of course, 500 years, the first generation Nephilim killed the watchers uh, are, are cast into Tartarus. Enoch is raptured. You see the flood there, and then you see the lifespan start to drop off. Pre-flood, man lived about 900 years, kind of on average. Methuselah was the oldest, 969 years. But lifespan begins to drop off after the flood. I believe that was because the at atmospheric conditions changed dramatically. They were exposed to more harmful radiation of the sun than they had before, things like that. Um, but in the first 450 years, you can see right here, 450 years to the Genesis 14 war, which we're going to talk about in a minute. That's a really, I call that World War I, the Genesis 14 war. Very interesting thing happens. Uh, but the main thing I want you to focus on here is people are still living up to the time of Moses. Uh, Moses, in that area, th those guys lived 120 years. In the time of Abraham, people are still living to almost 200 years. Uh, and prior to the time of Abraham, people are still living 500 years or so. That's kind of what yeah, starts to drop off from there. Now. The top column there, you, you see the, uh, the good guys, so to speak. You got the Shem, Arphaxad, Selah, Eber. These are the ones in the lineage uh, that, that Christ descended from, uh, right there. Christ came through uh, Shem's lineage. But in the middle column there, you've got the, be the beginning of the giant races, immediately after the flood. So Ham gives birth to, uh, his wife gives birth to Canaan. Amorius is a son of Canaan. Amorius is the father of the Amorites, which we just showed pictures of Arnold Schwarzenegger scaled up to the size of an Amorite. Okay, so here we, right away, the, the, the grandson of, of Ham is this massive giant, apparently, because these guys got huge. Uh, Mamre is another Amorite. He was born sometime right, right about where I've got it depicted there. Uh, he had brothers Aner and Ishkel. And Mamre shows up almost at the same exact time as Terah shows up, Abraham's father. So you're going to see kind of this parallel thing going on. There's like the beginnings of a great war is already starting just with the birth of some of these people. You've got Mamre being born about the same time Terah is born. Uh, Arba born about the same time Abraham's born. Anak, son of Arba, is born right about the same time Isaac is born. Then, of course, you have the sons of Anak. The sons of Anak are the ones that filled up the land of Canaan. And, of course, uh, Isaac's son Jacob and the Israelites were the ones that conquered Canaan. So you've got these, all, this is all happening simultaneous. They're happening at the same time. And you can see uh, the colored area right there of the Levant, the, how much territory the Amorites took over. They took over a lot of territory in the land of Canaan. Now, the Genesis 14 war, the Battle of the Nine Kings. I'm not going to read all this here, but you can see uh, I've got highlighted a bunch of names, and we're going to break those names down uh, in a second here. This is an extraordinary war. The bottom, it says the, uh, the four kings and five. This is the Battle of the Nine Kings. It took place in Genesis chapter 14. Some of the names that I had highlighted there are Kedar Laamor, the king of Elam, Tidal, king of nations, Amraphel, king of Shinar, who I believe is Nimrod. And I've read a lot of other scholars who believe that's true too, that Amraphel may be just a title that he went by, uh, but Amraphel is a king of Shinar, possibly Nimrod. Arioch, king of Elasar. What do their, name, their names mean? If I grab that little book there and look up their names, Kedar Laamor is an Elamite name. It means it's broken down, or it comes from Kudur Lagamar, which means servant of Lagameru, who was the Akkadian equivalent of Ninurta, the god of war. Ninurta, I make the connection that Ninurta is another name for Nimrod. So this guy would basically be considered uh, possibly a general under Nimrod or servant of Nimrod. Uh, apparently he was pretty fierce. He was, he was a fierce warrior because we saw earlier in the passage I didn't read, they just took out a whole bunch of races of giants. They, it says that they smote these various giants that were listed there. Title, his name means cast out from above or from most high. That's what his name means. Uh, Amraphel, who again I believe is Nimrod. The, the name Amraphel means sayer of darkness. We already know what the name Nimrod means. It means uh, the rebellious one or we shall rebel. Arioch. King of Elasar, his name means lion-like. As soon as I saw that, I immediately thought about 1 Chronicles 11.22, where it describes this individual here who slew two lion-like men of Moab. Two lion-like men? What are you and it also says he went and killed a lion. So he's talking about a lion, and then he's talking about lion men. 
could we be talking about animal-human hybrids? I believe yes. We see lion men depicted on some of the, the um, hieroglyphs and stuff in ancient Egypt. So yeah, I believe we're talking about lion men there. That's what it says. And Arioch apparently was one of them. Uh, he was a hybrid. These are some of the giants, actually, that the nine kings, the, the four kings are said to have smote, killed, uh, in that list I didn't read earlier. The Raphaims, uh, the Zuzims, the Emins, the Horites, Amalekites, Amorites. What do their names mean? Well, first I want to say that this is one of the reasons why I think it, Nimrod's name, or Nim, when it says Nimrod began to be a mighty one on the earth, uh, the mighty hunter, it says that he began a mighty hunter. That means Gabor, a Gaborim hunter. I believe it could be saying that he was a giant hunter. Depends on which way you put the emphasis on the word. I think both ways. Was he a giant that was a hunter, or was he a giant hunter? <laughs> a hunter of giants. I think both fit. And I think it, that's supported by these giants that they smote. The opposing army of kings came from Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboam, and Bela. With the exception of Bela, Zoar, a tiny town, these are all areas settled by the children of Canaan, which we would already established were giants. Note, again, there are no fallen angels anywhere in this picture. The Genesis 14 war deals exclusively with the grandchildren of Noah, specifically the offspring of Canaan, and in the case of Nimrod, Amraphel, the offspring of Cush. Let's look at the five kings. They're listed here uh, by name. Bera, king of Sodom, his name means in the evil. That's what his name means. Bersha means in wickedness. Shinab, father's tooth, change of father. I don't know what to make of that. Shemeber, name of soaring, literally name of wing. Maybe he had wings, I don't know. The, the, the king of Bela is not named, but Bela means swallowing. So just looking at the names of the individuals and the places involved with the Genesis 14 war, it seems to indicate that we're dealing with giants and all kinds of weird hybrids. This is a pretty wild Lord of the Rings style war that took place in Gen uh, Genesis 14. And it says uh, toward the end of the war there, Genesis 14:10, and the veil of Siddim was full of slime pits and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and fell there and they that remained fled to the mountain. Josephus uh, tells us a little bit more about this. He says, these kings laid waste all of Syria and overthrown the offspring of the giants. So Josephus again just comes right out and tells you this is a war of giants. This is what we're talking about here. Uh, but it says that when they came over against Sodom, they pitched their camp at the Vale of, of the Slime Pits. For at that time there were pits in that place, but now upon the destruction of the city of Sodom, that veil became Lake Asphaltites, which we come to find out if you research that is the Dead Sea. So I am convinced that the greatest archaeological find of all time is waiting for us underneath the Dead Sea, which, oh, by the way, is drying up. So here we got all of these giants that were chased into the slime pits and died. I think there are some well-preserved, with all that salt, well-preserved giant remains from the Genesis 14 war. And I talked to my friend, Dr. Judd Burton. He's an archaeologist. I'm like, dude, if I ever come into the money, the, <laughs> man, we got to go digging. <laughs> we got to do get some. He talked about some of the equipment that they can use to, to scan underneath the ground to see what might be, look for anomalies and stuff to see what's under there. I'm convinced the greatest archaeological find of all time is waiting for us under the Dead Sea, based on Genesis 14. And again, there's no angels mentioned anywhere, none. So, neither are there any angels mentioned in the favorite scripture of my detractors, who will take the after that of Genesis 6-4 and apply it to Numbers 13-33. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who come of the Nephilim. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. So I put a little six-footer there next to a 36-footer, and it's pretty easy to see why they would have viewed themselves that way. I mean, think about it. That big guy there would have looked at the six-footer, well, a little grasshopper, I squash you like a bug. You know? And the other guy like, man, I feel like a grasshopper compared to that guy. Right? Uh, just take the scriptures for what it says. I mean, why do they describe it that way? Well, I believe that's why they describe it that way. But you notice it says the Nephilim were the sons of Anak. Anak is a descendant of Canaan, not a descendant of angels. And it says right there, these Nephilim came of Nephilim. They came from Nephilim. It doesn't say they came from fallen angels. So again, I don't believe in the multiple incursions theory. There's no reason to believe in it. And Dr. Michael Heiser, even though he still believes, he's, he's another uh, scholar uh, that researches this stuff, he still believes, for whatever reason, in the multiple incursion idea, but he acknowledges that there really is no reason to do so. Listen to what he has to say about the breakdown of the Hebrew of Numbers 
You also have a problem with the repeat transgression. I'll be honest with you. I favor this view, but Numbers 13 might be a problem with it, and this is something I still need to think through. Very plainly says, we saw the Nephilim. Now watch this. Here's one spelling. Right here, the little letter. And here's the other one. We saw the Nephilim, ha Nephilim there. The Anakites are from the Nephilim. This phrase, from the Nephilim, is min ha Nephilim. You'll notice there's no yod here. You have the same word spelled two different ways. I think the reason why this is done here is because this is the way it's spelled in Genesis 6. The writer wants to link these Nephilim after the flood with the ones before the flood. And if that's the case, if the Anakim came from, in other words, were related to the Nephilim from before the flood, you don't need the continual cohabitation. You have a genetic relationship intact, so to speak. You do indeed have a genetic relationship intact, so to speak, and you have no need for a repeat incursion to justify the giants after the flood. Uh, so I was pretty excited to see Dr. Michael Heiser, he's a pretty well-respected individual in this field, acknowledging that fact and providing this little nugget for me, uh, uh, for my debate purposes, because <laughs> I love a good debate. Who were the Anakim? Uh, well, we just looked at Numbers 13.33, but let's, uh, let's do a little uh, genealogical chart. Amorius, the father of the Amorites, was the son of Canaan, and thus a contemporary cousin of Nimrod, Kaftor, and Shem's grandson, Selah. That places his birth sometime between 35 and 70 years after the flood, almost immediately. The only way that's possible is for somebody to have bad genetics going on there, passing this thing along. And the only option that I can see are the wives that came on board, that were part of the all flesh being corrupted in Genesis 6.12. Arba, as an Amorite and a contemporary cousin or a contemporary of Abraham, Arba would have been born sometime between 150 and 350 years after the flood. Anak, Arba had a son named Anak, who must have been born sometime prior to Joseph being sold into slavery or the house of Jacob going down to Egypt. His descendants are the ones that filled the land of Canaan while the Israelites were in Egypt. Sons of Anak, immediately following the exodus from, from Egypt, the Hebrew spies described the sons of Anak as being so big that they felt like grasshoppers by comparison. If the sons of Anak, who was the son of Arba, were that big, those genes must have been passed down from their great granddad, Amorius, who was the direct descendant of Canaan, son of Ham. I, I think the text speaks for itself. And here I got that highlighted in that time chart that I showed you earlier, showing where I believe Arba was born and Anak. Uh, or Amorius, Arba, Anak, and the sons of Anak uh, in the timeline there. I came across a documentary recently, as we're going to start to transition to our day now, uh, or at least shortly, uh, regarding the creation of ligers. How, how many of you have ever heard of a liger? Anybody hear of a liger? A liger is an unnatural hybrid, the combination of a lion and a tiger. <laughs> Listen to what they have to say about some of the characteristics of when they create this unnatural hybrid. Animal House. What do you get when you cross a lion with a tiger? This 900-pound flesh-eating beast. Hybrid animals have long existed in the imagination, from the beast of Greek mythology to the creations of modern-day science fiction. But they also exist in real life in some rather unusual combinations and in some rather intimidating ones as well, as Vicki Mabry now reports. This big guy is a liger. Yes, a liger. And trainer Doc Antle and his partner Rajani have the biggest one in the world. This is Hercules, who is our liger boy. 900 pounds and 12 feet tall. He's a gigantic kid because he's a liger. Father lion, mother tiger makes him... Father is a lion. Mother is a tiger. Makes him the liger. Oh. Oh. That's a good boy. Hercules is skilled at, well, Herc. eating Herc. Put leg up. about 100 leg pounds up. of meat a day. He's got these stripes and spots that are all over him that some young lions have, but they fade away. In him, he has more of a tiger pattern to his head of stripes that's 
Got some spotting in the middle of it. He, he has, doesn't have a mane. He doesn't so. have a mane. It's more like a tiger. But uh, in, in many ways, he is just kind of 50 50, and it's a blend. It's not one trait and another added together. Everything about him seems exaggerated. They l seem to live longer, they eat more. We've never seen anything happen in the Ligers except. Bigger, stronger, faster. But why create these exotic species? Antle views them as wildlife ambassadors. Hybrids have a place. In present day, their real place is awe and wonder, which I hope leads to an interest in the natural world. Samson, up, up, down, down. It's theorized that ligers are this enormous size because the inhibitor growth gene exists in the female lion and in the male tiger. So when you switch around and you get a male lion breeding with a female tiger, creating the liger, you get this gigantic size. Nothing tells it when to stop. In the wild, this enormous size wouldn't necessarily be of any advantage because it would require so much more food. Samson here can readily eat 25 pounds of food in a sitting where an adult lion can subside on seven to ten pounds of food. Helps us to maybe understand where some of the saber-toothed tigers may have come from, right? Uh, something interesting, I was looking at that and thinking to myself, wow, so they had determined that it's the, um, the uh, female lion that has the growth inhibitor gene and the male tiger. So when they switch it and use the male lion, and a female tiger, there's no growth inhibitor gene. In other words, I have a gene in me that said Rob stops growing at five foot ten and a half uh, at 16 years of age. I, that gene kicked in and said, oh, stop. This thing just keeps on growing. And if you go to their website, which is ligerliger.com, L I G E R L I G E R.com, you can see all about these things. Look at what they named them Hercules, Zeus, Sinbad, Vulcan. They named them the Nephilim. That's what they named them. Uh -huh. I'm thinking, man, I think that's exactly what's going on with the Nephilim. You start corrupting the image, opening up forbidden gates, you get crazy things like this. One of the things he said, what? one of the things you get with these hybrids is bigger, stronger, faster, and they eat a lot, right? Obviously, you saw how big that thing was. You, that thing needs a lot of food to, just to keep its heart beating, right? The same is true with the human hybrids or the giants that we see in scripture. I told you before, Amos 2.9 describes them as the size of cedar trees, right? And same thing in Numbers 13.33, they described that we look like grasshoppers by comparison. So I've got some scale giants here for you. Average six foot man there in the lower left, Og of Bashan, Goliath scale. Goliath is nine to 12 feet, depending on who you read. Og of Bashan, 15 to 18 feet, depending on who you read. Uh, then you got the early Canaanite giants in the smaller end of the scale of a cedar tree, uh, between 20 or 24 and 36 feet tall. Well, when you look through scripture, you find that sometimes it, it seems that the, the, the writers just insert something that doesn't appear to have anything really to do with anything. I mean, it's interesting or whatever, but so what? Like the grapes. When you're reading in Numbers 13, remember the story about the grapes? Man, it took two guys to carry a cluster of grapes on a pole. So what? I mean, it's, it's just they got big grapes there. Wow. Well, as I'm studying the giants and looking at all this stuff and thinking about height and all this, I, my wife had actually brought me a bowl of grapes, and I actually had a full cluster of grapes in the bowl. So I'm, I'm already studying all this. I look at this cluster of grapes. I grab it. I walk into the bathroom, and I hold it up to, the, to my head just to get a scale. I wanted to see. I wanted to get a scale. I'm like, why? You know, this is cool. Why would you put it in here? You know, big deal. So I held up a cluster of grapes to my head just to get a scale to how big, how big does a cluster of grapes look to a person's head? And then I began to think, how big would this cluster of grapes have to get before I couldn't carry it anymore by myself? You know, I'm fairly strong. I'm 170 pounds. I'm thinking, okay. I started to scale up a giant with a cluster of grapes just to see how big it would have to get before I would need help. Yeah, well, I kept doing it, and uh, I found that I, it'd have to be over a 30-footer before the cluster of grapes would be scaled such that it'd be so big that I would need to ask my buddy for help carrying the thing. So I found that the cluster of grapes actually helps you understand the scale of the giants, interestingly enough. Wow! Now obviously these grapes are genetically engineered because grapes don't grow that big, you know, today. So, but you got guys like that walking around, you gotta feed them somehow, right? Um, 
Douglas Hamp, in his book, Corrupting the Image, he talks about how much one of these guys has to eat. And he was talking, he says, if we use the more conservative weight, he's talking about Aga Bashan. He's analyzing Aga Bashan. Again, Aga Bashan is between 15 and 18 feet tall, depending on who you read. If we use the more conservative weight calculation, then he, Og, would have needed to consume at least 22,657 calories per day just to stay alive as per the basal metabolic rate, which calculates based on a person's height and weight, how many calories they need to live if they are not doing any significant work per day. In other words, that's how much that dude has to eat just to keep his heart beating, <laughs> just to stay alive. But we learned from scripture that Og of Bashan was a warrior. This guy was a fighting man. So he obviously had to eat quite a bit more. In modern terms, we might think that Og would have had to eat more than 30 pizzas or about 150 cheeseburgers per day in order to get the needed calories to maintain the lifestyle of a warrior. We're talking about Og, this, this little guy down here in the lower left. Just imagine how many calories per day that guy needs to eat. It helps you understand why the Hebrew spy says the land devours itself. Man, giants need a lot to eat. <laughs> the sins of the fathers is something else that I, uh, I decided to take a look at. You know how scripture talks about that in, in several places, and we got two places here, Exodus 20, 4 and 5, it's talking about the second commandment there, uh, and then it talks about, I, the, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. And then it talks about it again, same, same terminology in Numbers 14, 18, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. I'm thinking, is God just applying the sins of, uh, that we commit to our offspring just to be vindictive? Or is there a genetic reason for this? Is there something going on in our genetics that when we commit sin, it actually passes on to our offspring as far as the third and fourth generation? Started to think about that. We've got two confirmations here that this, this is an issue. God visits the sins, third and fourth generation. Came across an interesting documentary dealing with epigenetics. That was something I never really heard of before doing this research, but I'm gonna play a few minutes of a clip from TED. I forget what TED stands for, but there's like these conferences that happen all the time. You can watch TED conferences on YouTube. It saw one, a, a TED conference on epigenetics by an individual uh, named Courtney Griffin. She's talking about mice, rats, and things and experiments that they're doing with epigenetics. But instead of thinking about mice, I want you to think about Nephilim, okay? I want you to think about what we're talking about here uh, with regard to what she has to say about how epigenetics work. What is it that makes our cells different from one another? What makes them look and behave differently? What is it that makes a muscle cell, for instance, look different from a neuron? After all, these cells contain exactly the same DNA, but it's their epigenetic instructions that help tell them which genes to turn on and which ones to turn off. And with those different genes at play, these can become very different cells. So you might be wondering, when does all this epigenetic information get laid down on our chromatin? And the answer is that much of it happens during our embryonic development. So interestingly, when you were first conceived and you were just comprised of a few undifferentiated embryonic stem cells, which had the potential to become any cell in your body, your chromatin didn't have many epigenetic marks on it. It was only as your cells began to divide and receive signals and information from surrounding cells that the epigenetic marks began to accumulate, and then the genes began to get turned off and turned on, and the muscle cell became very different from the neuron. This brings me to a really important point about epigenetics, and that is that epigenetic marks can be influenced by the environment. And when I say environment, I don't just mean those surrounding cells that tell a neuron to become a neuron. I also mean the environment outside of the developing embryo. So the food that mom eats, or the prenatal vitamins that she takes, or the cigarettes that she smokes, or the stresses that she encounters at home or at work, can all be transmitted as chemical signals 
through her bloodstream to her developing fetus, where they can get laid down as epigenetic marks that affect the fetus's own genes and long-term health. Now, this has been shown experimentally in mice. Mice contain a gene called agouti, which makes them obese and yellow and susceptible to diseases like cancer and diabetes. This gene and these traits can be passed down from generation to generation through DNA, so that an agouti mother will give rise to a fat, yellow, disease-susceptible offspring. If that offspring contains the agouti gene, now here's something interesting about the agouti gene: it can be turned off if silencing epigenetic marks accumulate around it. So, if a pregnant agouti mother is fed a diet which is supplemented with these silencing epigenetic marks, those marks will be chemically transmitted to the DNA of her embryo. Where they'll accumulate around that agouti gene and effectively turn it off, her embryo will maintain those marks, and so it will be born and grow up to be an adult mouse that's thin and brown and healthy. Even though this mother is genetically identical at the DNA level to both sets of these offspring, you can see that the diet that she consumed during her pregnancy can affect the health and appearance. Of her offspring, these correlations between maternal behavior during pregnancy and the long-term health consequences for their offspring are thought to be linked by epigenetics, much as you've seen here in the case of mice. Now, another important point to make about epigenetics is that these types of marks can be transmitted not only from a pregnant female to her fetus, but also from generation to generation. If the marks are put down on our sperm or eggs, so if you're in the audience and you're not pregnant and you're not even thinking about conceiving, think about this because the、um, lifestyle decisions that you make today can still affect future generations. Now, this idea of transgenerational inheritance of epigenetic marks is still being debated and studied in terms of humans, but I should add. That non-human organisms, mice, flies, worms, there's mounting evidence that this theory holds true. In fact, it's being shown in the lab that over tens of generations, epigenetic marks can be passed down. This actually brings up a really encouraging point about epigenetics, in that epigenetic marks are reversible. I think this concept. That we can positively impact our genes is really profound and empowering, because we'd always worked under the assumption that our genes are set in stone, that they're beyond our influence. I want to end today by challenging you and myself to take the opportunity that we have before us to positively impact our long-term health by treating our epigenome kindly. Through healthy lifestyle decisions. Thank you. Now, she talks about them in terms of healthy lifestyle decisions. But I have a friend of a friend of ours is was studying、uh, biology and came across a, a very similar study, if not the same study. And she was talking about the, some sort of focus group that was done with people who had made poor lifestyle decisions, like committing adultery or murder. And apparently, they found that in these focus groups, where they had a whole group of people committed the same poor lifestyle decision, and they all had a, a genetic marker on their DNA, like a scar, at the same point on their DNA. So everybody who committed adultery had the same genetic marker in the same spot on their DNA, a scar. Likewise, people who committed murder; they had a, a different mark in a different place. So could it be? I mean, when we talk about sin, they're, they're referring to them as poor lifestyle decisions. Let's just call them sin. That that's how our sin is actually passed on to the third and fourth generation, genetically, through these what she calls epigenetic markers. I'm just throwing it out there. I'm not a biologist. I don't know enough about it to talk authoritatively, but I find it very interesting. But I also wonder if there could be a study, or I don't know how this would be done, taking some of these same people in the That were in these focus groups, get them saved, 
get them born again, and then test again to see if what Paul says, that any man be in Christ, he is a new creation, a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Could it be that, because she said, epigenetic markers are reversible through good lifestyle decisions. I think scientists today are proving what the Bible's been saying all along. But I think also, if we look at this in terms of Nephilim genetics, because we're talking about codes, right? We're just talking about information, on and off switches, basically. What if the Nephilim genetics that were passed through the ark, uh, the, the women that may have come through on the ark, some of, it may explain why some of them produce offspring that were giants and some of them produce offspring that weren't. Maybe through, like Shem, Shem clearly followed in the ways of his father, was a godly person, that maybe through the act of simply, uh, you know, we look at the patriarchs, God had a way of saving people before Christ came, right? It says Abraham believed God, it was counted to him as righteousness. You know, God had some kind of accounting software or whatever, a way of accounting uh, righteousness in the pre-Christ time period. So I'm just putting it out there. Could it be that maybe that's why Shem's offspring were cleaned up of uh, this Nephilim genetics? And Ham's offspring, and you, you see Ham's disobedience right away, don't you? He sees his father naked. I don't know what was going on there. I'm not even going to try to speculate. But something was going on there. Noah got upset about it and cursed his grandson, which is odd. Because the story says Ham did something wrong, but he goes and curses his grandson. I speculate, and I admit this is speculation, that Canaan may have been born with polydactyl. Six digits. Six fingers, six toes. And the reason I say that is because the evidence suggests that the genes came from somewhere because the giants that we see in the Bible, many of them have double rows of teeth, they have six fingers, six toes. They've got these weird genetic anomalies. Where'd they get them from? Could it be that Canaan already manifested them when he was first born and Noah looked down and said, oh boy, here we go again. I don't know. But we see in the scriptures that the Israelites and the people of God had a, a lot of trouble dealing with the Canaanites. So. Uh, they clearly were not walking in the ways of God, and maybe they just continued to perpetuate bad epigenetic marks. Just putting it out there. And now, Canaan was cursed, but it doesn't say that Ham was cursed. So there's plenty of children in Ham's lineage that I, I believe they're just, just fine. There's no indication there's anything wrong with it. There are a few suspects. Obviously, I think all of Canaan's uh, children are, are definitely suspect, uh, at least one in Mitzrayim's lineage and one possibly two in Cush's lineage. Clearly, Ham had plenty of other children who did not have bad genetics, okay? So please hear me on this. I am not advocating or in any way suggesting that Ham's line is cursed. I do not believe this is a race issue. I believe that this is an obedience issue, obedience both before and after the flood. Some were obedient and followed the ways of God. Some were not. Let's look at what happens to people who are obedient. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 9 says, Know, therefore, that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments. To what? A thousand generations. Now we look at disobedience, so we'll go back to one of the verses I showed you earlier, Numbers 14, 18. The Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation when it came to mixing species and creating Nephilim, well, that was certainly an act of disobedience, uh, which came with the consequences that, of course, I've been talking about in this presentation. And, so, and that's what I, I suggest may be going on right here in Genesis 15, where it says in the fourth generation, there's that same thing, fourth generation. Now, th this part right here is written before what we see in, in Exodus where God says right there that the, this is the first occurrence that I'm aware of, and I could be wrong, but I think the first occurrence is Exodus 20, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon, uh, upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. This is written before that, Genesis, talking about the fourth generation, the iniquity of the Amorites. Just putting it out there. I don't know. It's something interesting to look at. Post-flood giants, they go by many names. Here are a few of them. Nephilim, of course. Raphaim, the name Raphaim means the dead ones. So these are walking dead ones. <laughs> Zuzim, also known as Zamzumim. Their name means roving creatures, contrivers of evil, achievers. These guys were builders. They definitely were achievers. They built huge megalithic structures uh, out there, but they were roving contrivers of evil. The Imims, their name means the terrors. <laughs> 
Uh, the Horites, they, their name means troglodyte or cave dweller. Amorites means the sayers. I'm not quite sure what to make of that. But some would say that they actually, the, the giant, Josephus writes of the giants as having uh, terrible sounds, that they could make terrible sounds that were uh, horrific to the hearing um, and terrible to the sight as well, these, some of these creatures. Amalekites, people of la lapping or licking up. Not sure what to make of that. <laughs> Maybe they're a bunch of slobberers. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. The Anakim. <laughs> The Anakim, uh, their, their name means long-necked ones. So uh, and in Deuteronomy verse seven, or chapter 7, verses 1 and 2, we see it says, When the Lord your God brings you into the land where you are entering to possess it and clears away many nations before you, the Hittites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and stronger. Yeah, greater and stronger. These are the same guys, some of these guys here listed the ites that you find in the lineage of Canaan in Genesis chapter 10. You know, he's naming them here again. Nations greater and stronger than you. And when the Lord your God delivers them before you and you defeat them, then you shall utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them and show no favor to them. These are the, God's pretty, pretty hardcore here. So we have a choice. Either God's in genocide or there's a reason why he's doing this. And I submit there's a reason why he's doing it. They're wiping out Nephilim territory. They're cleaning the land of bad genetics. In order to possess the land God had promised their ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Israelites had to completely cleanse the land of Nephilim's seed. And for the most part, they did a pretty good job. However, Joshua and his boys failed to get them all. After a number of victorious battles, we find this report concerning the giants, uh, giant sons of Anak that remained. In Joshua 11.22, it says, There were none of the Anakim left in the land of the children of Israel, only in Gaza, in Gath, and in Ashdod, any remained. Curiously enough, those are still hot spots in the world today. <laughs> those same regions. Hmm. And, uh, of course, because they didn't get those, uh, those giants and Nephilim, for the better part of the next 400 years from that time period or so, these remaining false god-worshipping giants would pose a constant threat and prove to be very problematic for the children of Israel, especially the Philistines, who were descendants of Mitzrayim's son, Kaphtor, from Crete. These giants and their offspring were mentioned even more times in the Bible than the Amorites, they became one of Israel's primary enemies with about 270 references in the Bible. They were a constant problem for God's chosen people. But then along came a shepherd boy filled with the Holy Spirit and the fire of God running through his veins. And he had a slingshot, five stones, and a whole lot of faith. I don't think he picked up five stones because he thought he was going to miss. I believe he picked up five stones because Goliath had four brothers. May we have the faith of David. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine talking this way about our God? May we have the courage of, of, of Joshua and Caleb. you got to imagine Caleb. You know, Joshua you didn't really even say much when the spies first came back. It was Caleb going, yeah, we can surely do this. You saw what they were up against, minimum 36 footers. Caleb was like, so what? Let's go. You know, Joshua later piped in in agreement, but the other spies said, no way, man. Ooh, no, there's no, not a chance. Well, because of their disobedience and disbelief and lack of faith, they had to wander around in the desert for 40 years until those guys died off. But then, I love Caleb, man. After all of that, he's like 80, 84 years old at this time. He says, give me Hebron. Hebron was formerly known as Kiriath Arba, which means the city of Arba. Arba means four. It's the biggest of the biggest. And here's Caleb, 80 years old. Give me, Ar give me Kiriath Arba. I want Hebron. May we have the faith of Joshua, Caleb. Caleb means uh, wholehearted, if I remember right. And, and Yeshua, Jesus' real name, Joshua, Yah is salvation. And David, man after man's own, uh, a man after God's own heart. Why do I say that? Well, obviously these are great men of faith, but I believe we're going to need to be as well because... They may be coming back, they meaning the Nephilim. And so with that, I uh, thank you. That, uh, that brings an end to part one. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.